A 45-year-old white male presents to his family physician's office complaining of nighttime heartburn and difficulty swallowing. He points to an area about two centimeters above his xiphoid process. The pain is associated with nausea but no vomiting, a feeling of bloating but no real chest pain. The pain is relieved by antacids and he finds it necessary to use between two and four tablets of Tums every day to control his symptoms. He hasn't lost any weight and is otherwise active. He has a fairly stressful job as a postal employee. He used to smoke between one and two packs of cigarettes a day, but he quit about a year ago using Nicorette gum. He drinks, in his own words, about a six pack a month but he only takes Tums and no other prescription medications. His past surgical history was notable for removal of an ingrown toenail 15 years ago, no other operations. An older brother was recently diagnosed with esophageal cancer and our patient is also worried that he too could have cancer. Our patient is of normal height and weight. He isn't obese. Vital signs are normal, he has no fever, his pulse oximetry is normal, his blood pressure is normal. The head and neck examination is normal, there's no evidence of palpable adenopathy, his lungs are clear, there are no rails, ronchi, or wheezing. The cardiac examination shows a normal S1 and S2, there are no murmurs. The abdominal examination shows a flat, non-distended abdomen that's soft, there's no abdominal pain. The rectal examination is hemocult positive with a normal sphincter tone. His prostate is smooth without any nodules. Neurologically, he's normal. The cranial nerve assessment is also normal. In summary, this is a 45-year-old male who complains of heartburn and localized dysphagia. What scheme would you start with? And based on knowledge of his history and physical exam, where can we start in that scheme? Because of our patient's youth, we do not typically think of chest discomfort. However, while this scheme should be considered, it's not our first choice given the patient's clinical exam, age, history, and physical. You have selected an incorrect scheme. Please discuss your choices with your facilitator and then reselect. Abdominal distension is not the correct scheme. Our patient does note to be complaining of a little bit of bloating, but it's a minor symptom. No, nausea and vomiting is not the correct scheme. In this patient's chief complaint, nausea is a minor symptom. Abdominal pain is not the correct scheme. Our patient is noted to complain of some bloating and epigastric abdominal discomfort. His physical examination did not suggest abdominal pain. This is not the correct scheme. Gastrointestinal bleeding is also not the correct scheme. Our patient was noted on rectal examination to have a hemocult positive stool. Again, we can't forget about this, but this is not the initial point that we want to take. Based on this patient's history, physical exam, and clinical presentation, you must now choose whether you believe his dysphagia is oropharyngeal or esophageal in cause. Based on this patient's history, physical exam, and clinical presentation, oral pharyngeal dysphagia is the wrong choice.
You have chosen esophageal dysphagia. This is correct. You must now, based on the patient's history and physical exam and clinical presentation, choose whether the patient has a structural defect or a possible neuromuscular cause. You have chosen neuromuscular. This is incorrect. Please discuss your choice with your facilitator. Our patient will require at some point in his workup an upper endoscopy. However, an upper endoscopy only gives us information on anatomical status and very little information on functional status. Therefore, in this patient, an upper endoscopy will be done after other studies first. Based on our patient's history, physical exam, and clinical presentation, he is most likely suffering from a structural etiology of his dysphagia. The best radiographic test is an upper GI series. One should always order an esophagram with the upper GI series so that the radiologist will obtain views of the esophagus also, rather than just the stomach. A barium cookie swallow is indicated to help rule out oropharyngeal sources of dysphagia if the diagnosis is still in question. Our patient has a minor complaint of abdominal bloating. Because of this, a abdominal ultrasound is indicated, but it's not our first test. An abdominal ultrasound is a workup for the abdominal bloating, which is a minor complaint in our patient. A colonoscopy for a diagnosis of dysphagia may appear to be counterintuitive. However, this patient had a hemocult positive stool during his initial history and physical exam. Because of this, a colonoscopy will be indicated at some point in the future. However, the workup of dysphagia does not immediately include a colonoscopy. Therefore, it is not our initial choice. Testing of the esophageal pH along with manometry testing is a more advanced test and is not usually the first test in a workup of esophageal dysphagia. Esophageal pH and manometry testing is usually performed in those patients who suffer from severe reflux disease or a neuromuscular cause of esophageal dysphagia such as achalasia. An EMG would be indicated if we were working up a patient with dysphagia with presumed neuromuscular cause of esophageal or oropharyngeal dysphagia. It is a more advanced test and rarely adds significant information to the patient with an underlying suspicion of structural dysphagia. Blood testing is rarely helpful in the patient with dysphagia. If we suspect that the patient has iron deficiency anemia, he may have an esophageal web and suffer from plumber vincent syndrome, but this is exceedingly rare. A TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, can be a cause of dysphagia if the patient suffers from hypothyroidism. If the patient has severe gastrointestinal bleeding, a complete blood count with attention to the MCV, or mean cellular volume would be indicated. However, our patient has a much simpler workup. Blood testing is unlikely to yield any useful information. 
and would be counterproductive. Electromyelograms performed in a patient with esophageal dysphagia will most likely not yield any findings. EMGs are most likely to be performed in a patient who has oropharyngeal dysphagia and someone who has a neuromuscular disorder such as ALS or who's had a stroke. Our patient does not have either of these. As such, EMG is contraindicated. If you ordered blood chemistries or blood tests on our patient with dysphagia, you're likely to be disappointed. His thyroid stimulating hormone was normal. The complete blood count was normal. There was no sign of anemia. His iron studies were normal. And his other indices were also normal. At this early stage in the workup of our patient, esophageal manometry is not indicated. If you requested esophageal manometries in our patient with dysphagia before ordering other studies, this is incorrect. Abdominal ultrasonography done because this patient's complaint of bloating and to rule out biliary tract disease was normal. There was no evidence of gallstones, no evidence of cirrhosis, and no evidence of biliary duct obstruction or biliary duct dilatation. It was a normal study. Our patient, during his initial physical examination, was found to have a hemocult positive stool. Colonoscopy was indicated, but was not part of our initial workup. If you chose colonoscopy as part of his initial workup, you were incorrect. But a colonoscopy, done several months later, was normal, showing no evidence of blood, diverticular disease, cancer, or any other pathology which would lead to this patient's hemocult positive stool. Most likely, the blood from the hemocult positive stool was a result of reflux disease and gastritis. After the patient's upper GI series, which showed a Schottsky's ring, he is now scheduled to have a upper endoscopy to rule out carcinoma and to secure our diagnosis of a stricture that is benign versus a stricture caused by cancer. Our first image is of a normal GE junction. The second image shows a Schottsky's ring, as does the third image. However, the last image is placed for comparison. It shows Barrett's esophagitis. Barrett's esophagitis is a premalignant condition. Compare Barrett's esophagitis to the normal GE junction and compare the squamocolumnar junction of the normal esophagus to that of Barrett's. This is the upper GI series on our patient. It clearly shows a Schottsky's ring. A Schottsky's ring is a result of chronic reflux esophagitis with distal scarring of the esophagus. It also shows the distal esophagus and the diaphragm. Our patient is a 68-year-old white female who presents to the emergency department complaining of chest pain and difficulty swallowing intermittently for about the past three months. The chest pain occurs when she eats or swallows anything and doesn't seem to be related to the temperature of the food that she eats. She's not able to tell us exactly where the pain is other than saying, quote, my entire chest hurts. When she first complained of these symptoms, she saw her family physician. He performed an EKG and, according to the patient, it was normal. 
She doesn't smoke and never has. She's never used any other tobacco products. She was also recently evaluated for this chest pain by her cardiologist. Her cardiolite stress test was normal. She even had a coronary angiogram because of the fear of a possible false negative result. Her angiogram, which she reports to you, was also normal. She's never traveled out of the continental United States. Her medical and surgical history is notable for a cholecystectomy about five years ago, and she had a colonoscopy eight years ago, which she says was, quote, normal, end quote. Her current medications, she has no known drug allergies. She does have high cholesterol and hypertension, and she takes a daily aspirin. She takes a tenolol, 10 milligrams a day for hypertension, and Lipitor, 25 milligrams every day for her high cholesterol. Based on the patient's symptoms, her previous medical workup, and surgical history, which scheme would you choose to begin with? You have selected an incorrect scheme. Please discuss your choices with your facilitator and then reselect. In an elderly patient with hypertension, high cholesterol, and chest pain, to choose the scheme for chest pain is a logical choice. However, this patient has had an extensive cardiac workup, including an EKG, a cardiolite stress test, and even an angiogram. All of these were reported to us as normal. We have not reviewed the patient's old medical records and we're relying on her history that they are indeed normal. However, this scheme, while being important, is not the correct choice. You have selected an incorrect scheme. Please discuss your choices with your facilitator and then reselect. In an elderly patient with hypertension and high cholesterol who presents with chest pain, one must indeed consider abdominal pain as the source of the patient's discomfort. Chest pain could be an epigastric pain referred from peptic ulcer disease, gallbladder disease, or even worst case scenario, a dissecting thoracic aneurysm. However, given this patient's extensive normal cardiac workup, we should focus on the patient's chest and not her abdomen. In this case, while abdominal pain and the scheme should be considered, it's not our first choice. Based on this patient's history, physical exam, and clinical presentation, you must now choose whether you believe his dysphagia is oropharyngeal or esophageal in cause. Based on this patient's history, physical exam, and clinical presentation, oral pharyngeal dysphagia is the wrong choice. You have chosen esophageal dysphagia. This is correct. You must now, based on the patient's history and physical exam and clinical presentation, choose whether the patient has a structural defect or a possible neuromuscular cause. You have chosen structural dysphagia. Based on the patient's history, clinical exam, you are incorrect. Please discuss your choice with your facilitator and move on to the patient's physical exam. Our patient is awake, alert, oriented, in no distress. Her blood pressure, pulse, temperature are all normal. Her respiratory rate is normal and her pulse oximetry on room air is about 93 percent. She seems comfortable and she is not clutching her chest. She's not coughing and she's not complaining of any jaw or left arm pain. Her pupils are equal in size reactive to light. Her chest is clear to auscultation. She has no heart murmurs and her cardiac rhythm is normal and there is no ectopy. She has no cervical adenopathy of her neck or of her axilla. 
the trachea is not shifted, and her thyroid gland is non-palpable. The abdominal examination is soft, non-tender, non-distended, with normal bowel tones. She has scars from her prior cholecystectomy. A very brief neurological examination shows the patient's cranial nerves to be intact. Her strength is equal and symmetric. She has no rashes. Rectal examination was not repeated because it was performed recently in the family physician's office about a month ago and was hemocult negative. The patient denies a history of seizure, stroke, weight changes, fevers, chills. She further denies a history of nausea, vomiting, or a history of a myocardial infarction. She denies a history of diabetes, hepatitis, bright red blood per rectum, dysuria, frequency, hesitancy, or chills. She does admit to having hypertension and high cholesterol for which she takes medications. And she does admit to chest pain as described above, but she has no known history of a hiatal hernia. Your first test should indeed be a repeat EKG. Given that our patient has had a nearly exhaustive cardiac workup, we still cannot turn away from the fact that she could be having cardiac angina. A repeat EKG and comparing that EKG to the patient's previous EKGs is an absolute necessity. A complete blood count will help us to determine if this patient is suffering from anemia. Anemia in an elderly patient can present with chest pain because of the reduced oxygen carrying capacity of a low hemoglobin level. Asking for the proper diagnoses and thinking of which diagnoses will support your blood test will keep you from ordering and requesting unnecessary blood tests. In an elderly female patient who has chest pain, asking for a set of cardiac enzymes is an absolute necessity. Whether your hospital has a specific set of blood tests which come with the standard cardiac enzymes is something to be uh, entertained. Most hospitals will give you a troponin level, a CK, an LDH, and if you want it, a CKMB. Nevertheless, an elderly female patient with chest pain deserves a repeat EKG and, at a minimum, a set of cardiac enzymes. A comprehensive metabolic profile is a Medicare term for a standard set of blood tests. A comprehensive metabolic profile, or CMP, contains electrolytes, a BUN, creatinine, basic liver function enzymes, glucose, calcium, among other tests. In this patient, if there are any of those blood tests which will help us to decipher this patient's underlying cause of chest pain, we should indeed request a comprehensive metabolic profile. To request iron studies, such as a serum iron level, transferrin or iron binding globulin along with a calcium can help us decipher this patient's cause of chest pain. Many patients who have elevated calcium in hyperparathyroidism can present with chest pain. Therefore a calcium level alone would be helpful. Calcium is also included in the comprehensive metabolic profile. Iron studies can help us determine whether this patient has plumber vinson syndrome and may have an esophageal web, although many of those patients complain of dysphagia and not necessarily odynophagia. If we suspect our patient has underlying peptic ulcer disease, to request a serum helicobacter pylori antibody is within reason. However, the serum antibody can also be positive if the patient has ever had helicobacter pylori infection. 
Therefore, the best test, if we truly believe the patient may be infected with H. pylori and have peptic ulcer disease, is not the serum H. pylori, but rather checking the feces for H. pylori antigen. A chest x-ray in an elderly patient is absolutely indicated. This patient could have a dissecting aneurysm or other thoraco-abdominal pathology, in addition to underlying cardiomegaly or even pneumonia. However, in this patient, she's had an exhaustive workup from a coronary standpoint, has had an angiogram and EKGs. While I would still order and request a chest x-ray, it's not absolutely our first test of choice. Given that our elderly patient has already had an exhaustive cardiac workup, including an EKG, a cardiac stress test, and an angiogram, it's unlikely that she has underlying cardiac causes for her chest pain. This patient will and should have an upper GI series with an esophagram to help ascertain whether her complaints are related to the esophagus. Referring our elderly 68-year-old female for an upper endoscopy is something that we should entertain. However, an upper endoscopy before the patient has an upper GI series is relatively contraindicated. If the patient has an underlying esophageal diverticulum, the risk of esophageal perforation is higher than normal. Further, an upper endoscopy is not a good test to assess functionality of the esophagus. For that, an upper GI series with esophagram is a better test. If you chose upper endoscopy, you're right, you're just premature. A CT scan of the neck and chest should be considered as a later alternative. This is not the first test of choice in this patient. At this point, she's had a cardiac workup consisting of an EKG, stress test, and angiogram. CT scan of the neck and chest is unlikely to yield any further information until other studies have been requested. Esophageal manometry is an advanced test. This is not a test that can be performed or even ordered from the emergency department. The patient should be referred for a gastroenterological workup, and he or she can then make that recommendation after other tests have been performed first. If there are any other tests that you would like our patient to have in order to feel secure in your diagnoses, Please discuss these with your facilitator. Our patient had a repeat 12-lead EKG performed in the emergency room. It was normal. When compared to her prior EKGs obtained by her cardiologist and the EKG obtained from her family physician, it was the same. There were no changes. This is a normal EKG. The results of our patient's complete blood count has returned. It shows a normal white count, the hemoglobin and hematocrit are normal, and the platelet count is normal. The patient's MCV is also normal. The patient's cardiac enzyme panel, which includes troponins, CK, CKMB fraction, and LDH, are all normal. There's no elevation in the troponin, this is considered a normal study. The comprehensive metabolic panel has returned. It is also normal. The glucose is within normal limits. The BUN and creatinine show no evidence of kidney failure or decreased kidney function. And the electrolytes are normal, including the patient's potassium. This is a normal study. Iron studies are not routinely ordered from the emergency room and may take several hours to return. The patient's calcium is part of the comprehensive metabolic panel and it is returned as normal. When the iron studies finally return, however, they are also normal as is the serum transferrin and iron binding globulin. The helicobacter pylori antibody has returned. 
it is negative. Our patient has returned from the radiology suite. A PA and lateral chest x-ray has been obtained and reviewed by you and the radiologist. There is no evidence of pneumonia. There is no evidence of a widened mediastinum to suggest aortic rupture or thoracic aneurysm. The cardiac silhouette is normal in size and there is no evidence of an air fluid level seen within the esophagus. This is basically a normal chest x-ray. An upper GI series with esophagram has been requested. This is not usually a test obtained via the emergency room and is usually scheduled electively. However, you're in luck. The upper GI series with esophagram has returned and the image is shown. An upper endoscopy is not available to you as a test in the emergency room. If you've ordered this as a first-line test, this is incorrect. Please discuss your results and your reasoning with your facilitator. A CT scan of the neck and chest is relatively contraindicated in light of the patient's extensive cardiac workup and normal chest x-ray. A CT scan of the neck and chest can be ordered later if other studies so indicate. At this point, it's premature. Esophageal manometry is not available to you through the emergency room. The patient should be referred to a gastroenterologist for this examination. If you believe this test is necessary, and as a first-line test, please discuss your reasoning with your clinical facilitator. If there are any other clinical tests that you believe important, or blood chemistries, or other blood serologies, please discuss your reasoning with your clinical facilitator. The suggested 12 items are only suggestions and there are other tests which could be performed and made available to you through the emergency room. Please discuss your choices with your clinical facilitator. The diagnosis of chest pain will support almost all of our diagnostic studies blood test and radiographic findings. However, in and of itself, it is possible that it may be insufficient for one or two blood tests. It should be supported by another diagnosis if possible. Rule out myocardial infarction should not be used as a supporting diagnosis for the insurance company. Insurance companies do not recognize a rule out diagnosis in and as much as it may be and or seem appropriate, rule outs cannot be used. If they are used, the patient's claim will be denied and she will be held solely responsible for her bill. Hyperparathyroidism should be entertained in a patient with chest pain who has already had a cardiac workup. However, rule out should not be used in any diagnoses as an insurance company will refuse the claim with a rule out diagnosis. In this patient we entertain the possibility that she may be suffering from hyperparathyroidism however her serum calcium was normal. It is unlikely that she has hyperparathyroidism and a rule out is definitely contraindicated to be put on the patient's insurance claim form. Given the patient's chief complaint of chest pain, the diagnosis of hypertension, which already exists in this patient since she is currently being medicated with atenolol for the diagnosis of hypertension, will support our diagnostic workup. This should be a safe and good bet to support our diagnosis and get her bill paid by the insurance company. Hypercholesterolemia will support some, but not all, of the diagnostic tests which we have ordered so far to support this patient's diagnosis of chest pain. Hypercholesterolemia in and of itself is not a good choice to support our diagnostic studies. It should be used in conjunction with other supporting diagnoses. A diagnosis of difficulty swallowing or dysphagia should support most of our studies which have been requested so far. 
in and of itself, it may be insufficient to support some of our blood work and should be used in conjunction with other diagnoses. Most healthcare claim forms will allow up to four diagnoses to be listed before submitting the form to the insurance company. Odinophagia, or painful swallowing, should not be used alone as the single supporting diagnosis for all of our requested blood tests and radiographic tests. Odinophagia, in conjunction with chest pain, would lend strong support to our requested diagnostic studies, blood work, and radiographs.